Yeah. HR was told because they paid a lot for our company that you really go yeah, which old people were yeah. forty and up, yeah. get them out out the door. Yeah. And I'll try to the IT it's like they're trying to reorganize, evaluate the next level mm -hmm. of people and put them in place and we Okay, I'm gonna go get some coffee. Then we'll get started. They're still they still don't have a problem. Using the girls' bathroom. Hey, it's, hey, it's a short break. And I apologize, Jeff. Is it is it this mom y'all are dealing with? Y'all have y'all have just one of her children or two? Two. Two. That's why I kept going back and forth with my prayer because I can't remember if it was one or two. But it's a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And then there's actually three-year-old twins in between them. Where are they? They have a different dad and they're with the dad. So oh. we're actually close to them. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> okay. There are some preaching books that I like. All right. This, of course, is the book we're reading through. Um, we already read. We've already read through. And if you, if you've finished it, um, and I'll, you'll hear echoes of some of that in what I talked about tonight. This is. Um, it's, it's just, all right, go ahead, sorry. Well, you already took the other one off anyway. Well, you already, you've got that one. This is just a new one that I got recently from, um, I don't know, someone gave it to me. Um, but I like some of the content of it. And Expositional Preaching by David Helm from Nine Marks. And he has a little bit different approach to sermon prep than some of the other ones. Piper is all about passion, you know. So if you want to learn about passion in preaching and preaching for the glory of God and get pipers. Um, this is a Dever and Greg Gilbert's book. I'll, I'll refer to that some. We talk about um, how to plan out your preaching. The Joy of Preaching, Phillips Brooks is a great old um, 1800s book on preaching. Biblical Preaching Robinson, that's, just, that's been the handbook for preaching for many years. My, Martin Lloyd-Jones is a classic and of course christ Center Preaching, which is another Newer classic by Brian Chappell, Chapel or whatever he says his name. And this one, Johnny Can't Preach, is a good little book. It just kind of ex examines why preaching is falling on hard times in our culture. And it kind of it talks a little bit about the the way we the way even the way we process information has changed uh, culturally, and that has led to some um, some preaching challenges <laughs> in our day. But it's why why Johnny can't preach? It's a good little book. And then, of course, the one from that we just did. All right, so here's the plan. Is everybody in here? Yeah. Here's the plan. I got three sessions on preaching. That's not nearly enough. <laughs> but uh, we're going to basically, tonight, I'm going to talk about the importance of preaching. And then the session two, we're going to talk about sermon preparation. You know, what? Just, I'm just I wanted to be very practical, very practical. And then sermon delivery on uh, the, th the third session. Again, I'm just I'm looking at trying to be real practical with, with those next two sessions. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit more theological foundation for preaching. You notice the dates are a little strange. That tonight, next week is obviously next week, but then it jumps. The reason being because uh, I had to readjust the schedule because our next speaker, um, who's Joshua Crutchfield from Madisonville, uh, we had a bad communication between the two of us. It was actually my fault. And he got the wrong date scheduled to do this. So he's going to come and teach on leadership for two weeks in between my first, my second and third preaching. He'll teach on leadership. <laughs> then I'll teach on that preaching. Then he'll do his third session on leadership. So we'll have to go back and forth a little bit, but y'all will be fine. Um, 
this week, like I said, it's insufficient time, but we're going to see what we can do. You know, when I was, uh, before I went overseas uh, with my parents to the mission field, um, I grew up in South Central Kentucky. And South Central Kentucky is cave country. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been to Mammoth Cave and all the stuff over there, but it's cave country in South Central Kentucky. So every time we came back on furlough, I would go visit my grandmother where she worked. She worked at a place called Diamond Caverns. It was this beautiful cave. It's right. It's actually part of the Mammoth Cave system, but it was owned. It was a privately owned cave. And um, we go down in that cave, and I went down that cave so many times. I knew that cave like the back of my hand. Uh, I could, I could correct the tour guides when they missed something. Right? They they would miss a formation, or they'd explain the wrong date on this or whatever. And I oh no no actually that's. Um, but anyway, <laughs> but I, when I think about preaching, I think about it. Uh, it's kind of in terms of that. When you go down to Diamond Caverns, it was filled with wonders, beautiful things. And the job of the tour guide wasn't to create the wonders, <laughs> uh, who wasn't to draw attention to himself, but it was simply to draw attention to the wonders that were already there and to highlight them and to try to explain them a little bit further. And so the first step in preaching is Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I might that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The very first step in preaching is to be a person who desires to see the wondrous things in God's law. Because if you don't see them, you're not going to be able to take people on a tour of them. <laughs> and so you've got to start there. That's where preaching starts, is in your own soul. Um, another illustration to what a preacher does, and this is not my illustration, there's a book I used to have, and I hate this because I lend out books and I don't remember how I lend them to and they're gone. I used to have John Stott's book, Between Two Worlds. And John Stott's book, he talks about preaching as being a bridge. You're, it's, a, it's a bridge between two worlds. The world of the Bible, the text, and our world, you know, where we're at today. And what the, the preacher is doing is going is taking his people from here to here or taking the is the, you're taking the meaning of the text to our world today so it, it involves the three things we've already talked about in hermeneutics i wasn't here the last week but ob observation okay and then we have interpretation and the last one is what application okay so that's that's, how, that's the bridge if you don't do this you don't finish the bridge <laughs> if you don't do that. And so I'm not sure how much Thomas talked last week about application, but that's an important piece of your sermon prep. And that's the part I believe that most pastors, especially pastors are going to pursue sort of an expositional style of preaching. It's the part that a lot of pastors seem to neglect because they tack it on at the end. Oh, we've got to figure out some way to make this apply. And if you're not doing this, you're not building your bridge. So, um, preaching is bridge, build, bridge building. Um, now, we'll get to the text. We'll get to your, I'll tell you when we get to y'all's handout. I'll point out what we're, when we get to those specific parts. But first, let me just say that our theology and our convictions about the Bible will drive our methodology when it comes to preaching. Preaching doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not some disconnected practice that, okay, you just do preaching. It's connected vitally to our soul and and to our deeply held convictions so what do i mean I, I simply mean this do we believe that you know this is the word of god that's r2d2 sorry all right um let me turn my ringer off in case r2 beeps in again um Oh, and by the way, I meant to pass these out earlier, so you are going to help me look up some passages of Scripture here in a little bit. So just find that. And if you know it by heart, just say it by heart. Bible drill. There's two in First Peter. And there. And then if you guys would look up those. one, you, Okay. Okay, but you all can find those as I'm talking. So what do I mean by our, our, our deeply held convictions driving our methodology? Well, do we believe this is the Word of God? I mean, do we really believe this is the Word of God? If so, it affects 
how we preach. I believe that a high view of Scripture necessarily leads to a view of preaching that teaches, that, that, that treats God's Word accordingly. Okay, a high view of Scripture leads to a certain type, a uh, certain way of preaching. So the question is, do we really believe that God wrote a book? Y'all know who Bart Ehrman is? Okay, Bart Ehrman is the, he supposedly at one time was an evangelical, but you know, he was never truly saved. But he's a, he's a biblical scholar who, who basically likes to challenge um, Christians and, and basically tries to point out errors in the Bible and all kinds of other stuff. Anyway, he's a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And one of the things he does in his class, um, because usually his class is filled with a certain amount of people that claim to be believers. And so he will ask his class a question and say, how many of y'all have read, and he'll name some popular novel, maybe a Harry Potter book or whatever, and see all these hands go up. And then he'll say, how many of y'all have actually read all the way through this book, the Bible? And then maybe two or three hands go up, hardly any hands. He goes, see, you guys really, and he, and he uses that against them. He says, see, you really don't believe this is a message from God. Because if you really believed that, you would have read it. But you don't really believe that God wrote a book. So he, basically what he's trying to say is, you know in your mind that God didn't really write this, or else you would have read it. And unfortunately, I would dare say that that might be the case in a lot of our churches that there's a lot of people who haven't really read the book. But for us, if we really believe God wrote a book, then we should preach it. And we will preach it in a manner that reflects that we believe God actually wrote a book. <laughs> we'll preach sermons that are saturated with and structured by that book. So let's look at a very key passage, I think, when it comes to preaching is 2 Timothy 3, 14 through verse 4 of chapter 4. Now you remember... Chapter divisions and verse divisions are not inspired. <laughs> they were added later. So sometimes we take this passage at the end of 2 Timothy 3 and we, we kind of treat it as its own little segment and we divorce it from the very beginning of chapter 4. But they're vitally connected together. Let's just read it real quick. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So that's the man of God equipped for every good work. And it goes directly into verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. <laughs> preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. To say a right. So here's my point with this is simply this. An unwavering, and here's your next notes. The preacher must have an unwavering conviction about the power and sufficiency of Scripture. That's verses 14 through 17, of chapter 3. If we really believe verses 14 through 17, of chapter 3, then we will also have an unwavering conviction about the necessity and the urgency of preaching the scripture. So they're tied together. The end of chapter 3 is tied to the beginning of chapter 4. Preaching is built upon convictions about the word of God. John Stott also said this. He said the essential secret to effective preaching is not mastering certain techniques, but it is being mastered by certain convictions. Let me say that again. The essential secret to effective preaching is not mastering certain techniques, but it is being mastered by certain convictions. I read in Al Mohler's book, Conviction to Lead, which we'll read as a group later. Uh, and he didn't come up with this phrase. He quotes someone else, and I can't remember what it is right now. But he said, beliefs are things we hold, but convictions are things that hold us. So if we have convictions about the nature of the scripture, it should drive 
the way we preach. I believe with all my heart that the Word of God is inspired, inerrant, infallible, and all sufficient. Okay? Now, you need to know in Baptist life that word inerrant has a certain amount of baggage with it. But I believe it's a good word. And when we believe about the inerrancy of Scripture, we're talking about um, God's word as it was given to his people. It is inerrant. A high view of Scripture not only demands that we preach, but that we preach the actual words and meaning of Scripture. Okay? So it's not just that we have a high view of Scripture. No, I feel like I need to be preaching. Is that I've got to preach the actual words of Scripture and preach what they mean. So with that, let me say the type of preaching I'm in advocating for, not only in this CPC, but also in my role as Director of Visions, is expositional preaching, or you can call it ex synonymous with text-based preaching, which is what he talks about in our book, text-based preaching, or expository preaching. I, I prefer the term expositional uh, for a couple of reasons, but one of those being sometimes people think of expository preaching as more as verse by verse, uh, sort of running commentary type of preaching. And expositional doesn't doesn't have to be verse by verse. Okay, sometimes an expositional sermon can take a bigger chunk of scripture. So expositional preaching, and so um, but like I said, it's pretty much it's pretty much synonymous with um, expository or text based preaching. So let me give you some types of preaching in our day. That's your next blanks here. Types of preaching common in our day. Um, these, the bottom two? That's the bottom two are necessity and urgency. First word is necessity. Necessity and urgency. Yeah, unwavering conviction about the necessity and urgency of preaching. The top one? All right, am I going too fast? It's uh, power and sufficiency. Yeah, poder. All right, so the types of preaching common today. The first type is the type I just talked about, expositional preaching. So just type in expositional there in the first blank. Ex expositiva, is that how you say it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Expositiva. All right. Now let's talk about some other types. Practical preaching. Practical preaching. What do I mean by that? This... Well, it's preaching with a high focus on felt needs and application. So it's how to fix your marriage type preaching. Okay, that is a type of preaching very common in our churches today. How to fix your marriage, how to have a good family, how to, how to work for Jesus, how to do this, how to do this, how to sermons, basically. And um, so it does, by necessity, end up being topical because you're going to deal with a topic, whether it be, okay, and it's practical preaching. Now, it's usually high on application, and we can learn something from that because sometimes expositional preaching, as I said earlier, can be a little bit low on application. But uh, it's not being driven by the structure of the text. It's being driven by a topic to help you practically in life somehow, and then it pulls Scripture to that topic. Now, I will say, I'll save this for a little bit later. Next one is devotional preaching. And this is preaching this sort of personal insight type of preaching, impressionistic t preaching. Here's what God has really shown me in this passage. Uh, it's not necessarily saying, here's what God has said in this passage, but here's what God has shown me, here's how it's affected me. Devotional type preaching. So there's some pastors that think they're doing expositional preaching when they're really doing devotional preaching. They actually might even be preaching through a book, but they're not really hanging on every word of the text. What they're doing is giving you their impression of how they feel after reading the book. So we've got to be careful because sometimes, um, and, and by the way, devotional preaching, how, I, how this book has affected me, how I, there's even a place for a devotional type of teaching in a devotional type setting. <laughs> when it comes to preaching God's people, to God's people, it's not the type of preaching I would prefer. Finally, number four, doctrinal preaching. And what I mean by that is simply, uh, it's heavy on doctrine, but it's, in, it's a lecture. It's not really a sermon. And that one also can masquerade as expositional preaching. When people think they're doing expositional preaching, but if you're not doing these things, and you're just walking me through verse by verse through a lecture, and giving me the Greek and the Hebrew, and, and you're showing me all the 
contextual background and you're giving me a lot of doctrine out of it, but you're not showing me how to apply it to my life and you're not letting the structure of the text drive the structure of the sermon, then it's just doctrinal. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a seminary class. Okay. Now you will not be, let me say this real quick. <laughs> you'll not be kicked out of the CPC if you prefer a different method of preaching. <laughs> but, uh, my firm conviction is that our preaching must be shaped by and conformed to the Word of God. And the best type of preaching that makes that possible is expositional preaching. Now, I'm going to define expositional preaching here in a second. You're probably wondering, hey, Steve, are you going to give this a little bit more meat? And I will. Um, here's, but here's what I like what one person said with, with when they think of preaching expositionally. They said, when you're ex preaching expositionally, you're taking your congregation for a swim in the text. And uh, to sort of keep that illustration going, he said that some people are dive board preachers where they'll start with the text, dive into the sermon, and never come back to the text. Some people are pool furniture preachers. They'll come back to the text every now and then. But he says we need to be swimming pool preachers. We, we immerse our people in the text. We take our people for a swim in the text. Um, and we, we, we dive into the to the um, unfathomable deep depths of God's Word. Now, remember, the sermon, um, we should know, the sermon isn't about what we want to say um, and supported by a few Bible verses, but it should be about what God has to say. Uh, David Helm put it this way. He says, some preachers use the Bible the way a drunk uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. Okay? A drunk person's not using the lamppost for illumination. He's using it for, to keep him standing upright. And he says some preachers do that. They use the sermon to support the, the text to support whatever they want to talk about instead of saying, no, let's let it speak to us and we'll conform whatever we want to, whatever I'm going to say is going to be conformed to the word. All right, now that sounds great, but what exactly is expositional or expository preaching? Let me give you a few different definitions, and I'll give you my definition, which is drawn basically from the book here. Uh, Brian Chapel he says, expository preaching is preaching where the meaning of the message is the message of the meaning. I mean, the message of the passage. Sorry, let me say that again. Expository preaching is where the meaning of the message of whatever you're preaching is the message of the passage, okay? So whatever you're preaching, whatever meaning, it's also the meaning that's in the text itself. Uh, Dever and Gilbert in their book preach say expos ex expositional preaching is preaching in which the main point of the biblical text being considered becomes the main point of the sermon being preached. Um, David Helm again, he says expositional preaching is empowered preaching that rightly submits that uh, submits to the same. Sorry. I must have a misprint here. Submits the shape and the emphasis of the sermon to the shape and the emphasis of the text. Okay. Add shame. I was like, the shame? It submits, the, in other words, the shape and emphasis of your sermon is going to be the shape and emphasis of the text. And that's closer to the definition that I like that is from text-based preaching. And I'm shifting this just a little bit, but this is basically what our definition will be. Expositional preaching is preaching where the sermon represents... The substance, structure, and spirit of the text. So there's your blanks. You totally gave those away. Huh? You totally gave those away. Just wrote that right under. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> substance, structure, and spirit, all right? Substance. And I use the word essence, essentia, because I wanted three E's, just like we have three S's, okay? Substance, structure, and spirit. Can you read that? You're not supposed to read ahead, Jeff. Right. All right. And I think all three of those things are important. So what's the substance? Well, here's your blanks, your next blanks. That's the author intended meaning of the text. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I translated those correctly. You'll see. Yeah, the, the author intended meaning of the text. All right. That's the substance. Number two, the author intended framework of the text. That's the structure. The author intended framework of the text. And the third one here, we're not talking about Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, but um, it's the author intended emotional design of the text. 
Now I'm going to get when we talk to, when we get to sermon delivery. I'm going to spend some time talking about that because I think it's very dishonoring to God's word for for men to preach passionless sermons. Now, I know we're all wired different. Some guys are going to be more hollerers, and some guys are going to be more quiet, whatever. But we still must preach the text in a manner that reflects what the text, the spirit of the text. Okay. And so um, that's important to me is, is the, um, the pathos of how we preach. The shape, aim, and context and passion of the text is what drives our sermon. So um, it's, it's the text that drives the sermon. I heard another illustration I came across, um, they, said, they said that Michelangelo used to actually have a candle stuck to his forehead. He, would, he, would have a, he had this little cup with a hole in it and he put a candle in it. So when he was uh, either painting or when he was, uh, I think they said it was when he was um, like carving, sculpting, he said he didn't want any of his shadow to be on the artwork. He just wanted to be able to see what was in front of him and carve it correctly. And so as preachers, I kind of think of it that way, as we're carving our sermon, we don't want any shadow of us to be on the sermon. We simply want the light of the word to guide us, all right? the word to guide how we structure and how we chisel. There's still creativity involved, but it's creativity based upon the word, structuring it according to the word instead of um, um, uh, allowing our own will to take over and our, our image to be stamped upon the text instead of God's. All right, here's some things real quick. Good, good expositional preaching is not, okay? I'm gonna give you some things that's not. This is not in your notes, but I'll just walk through these. It's not necessarily verse by verse. I said this earlier. It, it can be this, and oftentimes it is this, but it doesn't have to be this. I've preached expositional sermons. I preached 12 weeks through the Minor Prophets, and I consider those expositional sermons one week on each Minor Prophet. So I'm talking about doing chapters of a book, doing an expositional sermon, because what I was aiming for was the overall structure and message of the book as a whole, and I preached that. And I highlighted a specific text to help them see that. But it was still an expositional sermon, even though I didn't go verse by verse through the sermon. So when I was down in El Salvador this week, I told them, first of all, you need to find the structure of the whole book of Mark before you start trying to find the structure of little individual passages. Once you have the meaning and the structure of the whole book, then you can go back and look at the little passages. Because what you, want to, what you don't want to do is have these little passages, well, I think this means this and that. When you realize, wait a second, Mark's whole aim of his book is going a certain direction, then, then I need to make sure that text is lined up with the whole aim of the whole book. So you can do expositional preaching that's at 30,000 foot distance or down at street level. <laughs> It can still be expositional preaching. It doesn't always have to be little verse by verse. Uh, good expositional preaching is not a running commentary. There's too many guys that think they're preaching expositionally because they have been able to somehow in their own words basically just rehash what John MacArthur wrote about every verse in that passage. Just because you can give me a comment on every verse doesn't mean you're preaching. <laughs> so it's not verse by verse commentary. Uh, good expositional preaching is not... A boring lecture. I talked about this a little bit ago, and you had to be—you had to guard yourself against detail overload. When you prepare a sermon, so we'll talk about sermon preparation, and I'll say this then as well: the quality of your sermon oftentimes will be determined by the size of your discard pile. You're going to do a lot of study and a lot of research, and you're going to, have to discard a lot of it, and it's not going to end up in your sermon. Guys that want to shove it all into the sermon, it becomes this boring lecture, and you got to be careful. That's not like, that's not expositional preaching. Um, ex good expositional preaching is not anti-topics and anti-human needs. Let me just say that as well. You can still do expositional preaching and choose to address a specific topic that your congregation might need to have addressed. I've said this before. If you want to do a sermon on prayer, a sermon series on prayer, do it. But make sure you're expositing the sections of scripture you're using for each sermon on prayer. But you may use several different passages on prayer for a month, and that's fine. <laughs> Just make sure that the text is driving the sermon. There, are, there is a time and a place for topics sometimes. But I also believe that your topics, if you'll preach through the word of God, you'll hit a boatload of topics you would never hit if you're doing topical preaching. <laughs> I mean, how many, how many sermons have you heard on fasting? Well, just preach, just preach through the Word of God, and you'll hit fasting plenty of times. But nobody talks about fasting in our culture today, unless it's intermittent fasting so you can lose weight. Okay? Um, 
Um, good expositional preaching is also not lacking in application, okay? It should not be lacking in application. Some people think, well, if I preach expositionally, I'll never apply anything. Because that's just like a, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the, the beef people have with expositional preaching. So, well, it's just like, it's like a seminary lecture. It doesn't really have anything to do with my life. Not if you're preaching well. Because words, the Word of God is always relevant to people's lives. And if you're preaching it well and you're involving application and you're asking God, how is this text intended to change me and thereby change the congregation, you will always find relevance and application. So expository preaching is not, or expositional preaching is not lacking in application. Uh, it's also not non-evangelistic, okay? That's the other thing people think. Uh, expository preaching, or, or they, they'll say, well, I don't do expository preaching, I do evangelistic preaching. Well, first of all, I believe the scriptures teach that every bit of the Word of God points to Christ. And so, you can always make a beeline for the cross. Now, you got to be careful. You don't want to do that artificially. We'll talk about that with sermon delivery. You don't want to do that artificially. But at the same time, you can bring it back to the cross. And I think um, expositional preaching is it edifies and it evangelizes. So there was a debate, I didn't hear that much anymore, but when I first got into church planting, there was a debate. All right, is a Sunday morning service, is it for the lost or is it for the saved? What's it for? Is it to edify the believer or is it to evangelize the lost? And I always thought that's, that's a false dichotomy. If you're preaching the word of God, and we're all called to respond to the word of God one way or another, it edifies believers, and that can be through conviction that leads them to repentance, and it also evangelizes the lost if you're preaching expositionally. So I don't think you have to choose one or the other. Expositional preaching does both. Also, expositional preaching is not lacking in creativity uh, and style. Um, uh, that's the other th thing people think that, oh, you know what? It's it just, you know, I can't be creative and I can't be stylish if I'm having to do expositional preaching. N not at all, remember, I think the way you, now the structure of the text needs to drive the structure of the sermon. But the way you prepare that for people, I consider it an art form. I consider preaching an art form. I kind of look at it as a, as, a, as a chef who's working on good food for his people. And if you think creativity, if you think creativity is just about doing a self-help sermon and having a bunch of cool illustrations and having some guy on a bike come out and do jumps on the stage or whatever to get people's attention, that's not creativity. I think that's like giving someone a Happy Meal with a toy. Creativity is the, is the expert chef that knows how to prepare the steak and leaves people's just wa mouths watering for more, okay? So it still involves style and creativity. I also mentioned earlier it's not irrelevant. Um, I think that um, we have to guard against preaching in a way that makes people think they've got to be, well, I guess I need to have a doctorate in order to be able to understand what my preacher's talking about. We gotta be really careful against that. Or to make them think that, to make them believe in a, accidentally, that the Bible involves some sort of Gnosticism. you got to have a seminary degree. you got to know Greek and Hebrew to really read that Bible, because that's all my pastor, I mean, he uses Greek words all the time up there. I, boy, I just can't, I can't read this book like he can. That is, we believe in the perspicuity of Scripture. Perspicuity of Scripture is the clarity of Scripture. It is accessible to anyone. Now, we're there, just like that. Let's go back to our cave, our cave illustration. The, the beauties are already there. We're just highlighting it. Okay, but anybody walking through the cave should, if they have eyes to see, see them. Okay, so uh, we had to really be careful against preaching in a manner that makes people think, well, I guess I'm just not as smart as him. And we, we kind of portray sort of this Gnosticism that you've got to have a special knowledge in order to understand the Bible like I do. And that is not expositional preaching. Um, okay, that's good. Uh, let me just say also, and this kind of ties back to evangelism, expositional preaching is not Christless. Christ is in all of our preaching. Luke 24, 27 uh, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures of things concerning himself. John 5, 39, Jesus said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. So the scriptures point to Jesus. All right. So faithful exposition explains what God has said in his word. Uh, it declares what God has done in his son, and it applies the message to the heart. It 
explains what God has said in His Word. It declares what God has done in His Son, and it applies the message to the heart. The power to save and to sanctify is found in the Word of God. And so our preaching must conform to the structure and substance and the style of the Word. Um, expositional preaching goes where the text goes. We don't start off deciding where we want to go. Instead, we commit to the Scriptures and go where it goes. We start with the Bible. Expositional or expository preaching is therefore utterly theological in its nature. Why is it utterly theological in its nature? Because, as we said earlier, we believe that God has spoken. When, God's, when the Bible speaks, God speaks, is what Augustine said. So when you preach, if you are preaching the Word, then God is speaking. If you are preaching the Word, the actual Word, then God is speaking. But if you're preaching your Word, <laughs> then God is not speaking. Well, the text actually says what the author intended is what we are to speak. Not what you wanted to say or what your creative little mind can make it say. What it actually says. And that's why expositional preaching is so powerful. It's not the model that's powerful. It's the word that's powerful. Okay? It's the word that's powerful. And so, we re I really do believe that God has spoken. He wrote a book. And therefore, everything about the book, the words that are in it and the structure that's in it, God inspired, the Holy Spirit inspired Mark. So I'm just I'm on Mark because that's where I was at all last week. He inspired Mark to write Mark in the way he wrote Mark, not to write it the way Luke wrote Luke. And to include the stories he included, not to include exactly the same stories Matthew included. And there's a purpose, there's a there's a there's a drive in Mark's gospel. And if you see it, then it then then you conform your preaching to it. Because you believe God has spoken. Um, and so the structure, the words, everything's important. And so that's why expositional preaching is important. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more a question about an opinion. Um, so you, you were saying about the expositional preaching. Um, I was in, 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 in a uh, uh, sermon that the preacher didn't even open the Bible. Yeah, that's not good. I'll give you that opinion right now. <laughs> and, and he did exactly use the same characters of the story he was portraying. Now, I was I was very suspicious of the sermon, too. I'm still. Uh, but then at the end of the week, because he was a student camp, uh, he was uh, narrating the story of Jonathan and his brother. And uh, I asked more people why he would use the Bible, why he would try to portray the story in different words. And he said, well, there's a lot of students here that they don't understand, they don't know John the leader. So I saw his point, but what do you think about that? Um, Especially because he was, I was tracking the story. He was pretty accurate with the story, but he wasn't using names or saying this story is found here in the Bible. He's using a method. He, he revealed, re, revealed it till the end. He's using a method called um, storying, Bible storying. And it's a method that's used a lot of times in, um, in evangelistic efforts in third world countries and or tribes and stuff like that. It's, it's where you, you tell the stories of the Bible and it's progressive storytelling. Um, I've always struggled with exactly um, that to a degree. I think it can be done well in some context if you are bringing it back to the scripture, here's what the Bible says, and if you want to elaborate upon that or whatever, as long as you're staying anchored to the text. But Bible storying without actually... I'm not sure how to help. Well, I didn't say anything, Google. Um, it, it, without, without, even if you're in a remote culture, you're trying to tell the people the story of redemption from A to Z, and if you don't come back at some point and say, God spoke this, God gave us this story, here's where it's contained, then, then you're not anchoring your sermon or your teaching in any kind of authority. It's just the authority of, you know, and I understand some cultures are auditory and they don't even have a written language, and so there's a need for storytelling, but I still think it has to come back and be anchored in the scripture in some sort of way. So if there's never, now in his case, to me, that's inexcusable. I understand there's people that have never heard the scriptures before, 
But it's it's interesting. One I heard recently someone say um, that um, when when unbelievers visit a church, that and this was like some sort of survey they did, and, the, and they they're actually surprised when the preacher doesn't actually spend much time in the Bible. Of Bec- course, they're coming to church. Well, they they're surprised. Well, because they the same thing Bart Ehrman said. Well, I thought you said God gave you a book. But you like read one verse and you never went back to the book. And so it actually, again, it's, it's, it's expository preaching, expositional preaching is more evangelistic because it's anchored to the book. So those kids, that's great. But if you're, eventually you're going to get to the point and you say, hey, yeah, well, you also know, you need to know we believe God inspired every word of this. Oh, he did? Well, it doesn't seem like that. <laughs> you, know, you told me the story and I know the story's in here, but so I think, I th- I think it's, it's not helpful to just use the excuse that we've got unbelievers out there who've never heard the Bible before, a good expositional preacher is going to preach it in a way to where he explains it carefully. And, uh, and it, 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 it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. I mean, particularly the story of Joseph is not that hard. You can just jump right in there in the Bible. You don't have to have the whole backstory. You can just say, once there was a man named Joseph that had all these brothers and they hated him. And, you know, just roll it right in there. I call him Joe. <laughs> you know, something that we're getting away from nowadays. But you know, when I preach, I actually use a Bible. I don't. Oh, do I may have my notes, but I actually have my Bible. Yeah. Oh. Like our pastor. He does that, but now he might have Bible on But the only problem that I see with that, perceive with that, is it's all fine and good that we all have our, you know, your phone and whatever we just follow. What happens if we had an EMP and these are gone? Or it always dead. And we all, yeah, or it goes dead or whatever. And what happens if all we have is that? Now, now where are you going to be? Because you're not going to be able to know what to do with those. You're going to be, you know, looking up, okay, table of contents and all that. To me, I would be, because I grew up in the church, I'd just be embarrassed. So I think some of that is in the service. Just at least you don't know how to use a paper copy. I understand, you know, about having it, it's a convenience. But uh, I don't know. I think that's another thing, you know, it's, it's easy to get into the, the storytelling, so to speak. Well, the more, you know, if the stories being told are, are intentionally being told, I'm actually going to re- retell the Bible story. I have less issues with that than the storytelling that happens a lot of sermons, which is pastors just telling sermons, stories to illustrate a passage and never getting back to the passage, right? Um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of preaching is, is, is storytelling. And I had a preach pastor like that. He just told lots and lots of stories. And I don't know where he got all his stories. And all the stuff that supposedly happened to him, he had quite an interesting life, but it never, he never preached. Um, expositional preaching. Let's, get to, let's, let's try to finish this tonight, if we can. Uh, why, why expositional preaching? Because, number one, expositional preaching appeals to God's authority. I think that's one reason to have the printed text. At least he's seen what you Right. But I understand using the tool that you were studying with to teach from. Yeah. Because you'll, I found that I'm not stuck with one. So I don't mean to sidetrack. No, that's all right. The authority, the expression of preaching appeals to God's authority. 1 Thessalonians 2 3. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is the word of God, which is at work in you believers. The authority. Now, we live in a culture that is anti-authority. We live in a culture, especially right now, that believes in absolute human autonomy. I can do what I want to do with my body. I can be who I want to be. I don't even have to be the same sex that I am. I don't. I, absolutely, I can. I can kill my baby. I can kill myself. Absolute human autonomy. And so, the preaching, exp, expositional preaching, is important in this culture to blow against those winds. We've got to push against those winds, and the expositional preaching appeals to an authority outside of us. 
See, some of the other type of preaching, devotional preaching, practical preaching, it doesn't appeal to an authority outside of us a lot of times. It appeals to my impressions. Here's my insight. Here's how I feel. This appeals to the authority of the Word. Number two, expositional preaching relies upon God's Spirit. All Scripture is breathed out by God, right? 2 Timothy 3.16, we read earlier, that's... That's, that's an allusion to the Spirit, the breathing out. The, you know the word for Spirit, both in Greek and Hebrew, is the same as the word for wind and breath. So it's a Spirit-breathed. It's, it's, it's Spirit-inspired. Um, 2 Peter 1, 20-21, No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by what? By the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think, well, expositional preaching is dry and Holy Spirit-less. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. Because we actually believe that the Spirit, Holy Spirit wrote these words. And so, Holy Spirit preaching is preaching that's totally tethered to these words. That's Holy Spirit preaching. And the Holy Spirit will... will um, conform people to the words <laughs> the holy spirit is at work in the heart as people hear the word the, the spirit in the heart agreeing with the spirit on paper <laughs> and changing people's lives that's how the holy spirit works it's a lot of holy spirit type preaching that's out there today d doesn't get back to the text it's just about what was the spirit doing in you through you, how you're feeling and, and unless we're coming back to the text then we're not anchoring the, the Holy Spirit will always agree with what's right here. I think I told you a, a, a guy that came into my office once and told me about a sin that he was living in, but he said, you know what, the Holy Spirit told me it was okay. <laughs> and I said, the Holy, the Holy Spirit does not contradict himself. Okay? It may have been the Spirit, but it might not be the Holy Spirit. All right. Must be yours. Go ahead. Here, let me give you. Let me consider. Let me give you another passage of scripture just about on that topic. Okay, Second Corinthians eleven three. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his coming, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. All right. So, so let's just pause right there. How did the serpent lead lead Eve astray? What did he say? Did God actually say? The way the servant led Eve astray was to deviate her from the word of God. And then it goes on in 2 Corinthians 11. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Now he's condemning them for this. And he's saying that it's the same error of Eve. The reason you're accepting a different spirit, the reason you're accepting a different gospel, the reason you're accepting a Jesus that doesn't jive with the Jesus of Scripture is that you've walked away from the Scriptures. <laughs> and so the Spirit of God always matches up with the Spirit-inspired Word of God. It just matches. Yeah. If you didn't say uh, that Colossians and Ephesians parallel, do you remember that? You've got both of them. Paul has this list. Mm -hmm. of these exact same things that are going to happen. And it's teaching one another, singing songs with one another, submitting to one another, uh, all of these things, and the list is identical. Well, in Ephesians, the verse that controls that idea is he says, uh, be filled with the Spirit. Right. And then he says, you know, teaching, singing, things like that. Well, in a parallel in Colossians 3.16, that controlling verb is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right. And it's teaching. Yeah, that's good. I forgot about that parallel. That would have been perfect for this point right here. Yeah. So, yeah, you understand that, that Ephesians and Colossians are very similar in a lot of ways, probably written at the same time by Paul. Um, and, and as in the same teachings, he tells one church to be filled with the Spirit, singing hymns, songs, spiritual songs, and goes on. And the other church, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly singing hymns, songs. So, in other words, how does the Spirit dwell in His people? He dwells in His people through the Word. Okay? All right. Thirdly, expositional preaching trusts in the power, trusts in God's power. Okay? 
Uh, the word of God is powerful. Jeremiah 23, 29, one of my favorite verses. It says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? So that image of God's word is this consuming fire and this, this hammer. So God's word does a few different things. And here's where I gave you all some verses to participate with. So if you, hopefully you got those verses looked up because here we go. God's word convicts, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and a spirit of joints of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All right. It, it digs deep into our hearts. It convicts us. It's like a surgical instrument to, to, to convict our thoughts and our passions even. All right. So the word of God is powerful. It convicts. It creates. Uh, of course, we know Genesis 1-3. God said... Let there be light. Let there be this. Let there be that. Let, so God said, but so in the physical realm, God's word creates, but also in the spiritual realm. James 1 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. He brought us forth. That's birthing language. He brought us forth by the word of truth. All right. First Peter 23 through 25 says it even more clearly. 1 Peter 1. Uh. one twenty, Yeah, one twenty three through 25, I believe. Right. So you were born again, not by perishable seed, but imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. All right. Um, Ro Romans ten seventeen. It creates something else other than just new life as well. Then faith is by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Ah, oh, how does faith come about? <laughs> by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God produces faith. Okay. We usually, usually we like to think of that faith comes just out of some vacuum in our own heart. No, we preach the word of God because it does something. It actually produces faith in people. Um, it sustains. Um, you know, Hebrews one three speaks of Jesus or the uh, the word of God. Um, he upholds the, the universe by the word of his power. So there's again physically sustaining the universe, but the word of God sustains us spiritually as well. Uh, Jeremiah fifteen sixteen. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and a delight in my heart. All right. So this image of the Word of God being something we eat, and it's this delight, it, it upholds us. First Peter 2, 2, again, image of God's Word being something we eat. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this milk. Okay, I would say that pure spiritual milk in the context is referring to the Word of God, Okay. And the Word of God sanctifies. Another one of my favorite verses, John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus praying for us. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. How do we, how do we become more holy and better believers? By the Word of God. Finally, Ephesians 5, 26. 5, 26? Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure. Because it says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That's it. By cleansing her with the washing of the water of the word. That's what God does for us. That's referring to husbands and their wives, but what's he comparing the husband to? Actually, what's he saying the husband is all about? What's the husband pointing to? The work of Christ in his church. Christ cleanses his church through the washing of the water with the word. All right? All right, so let me, uh, let me just move on real quick here. It's going to be really hard to get this in two minutes, but we will go as fast as we can. We live in a culture, as I already said, that rejects authority, autonomy of self. It also rejects truth. You know, whatever it means to me is what it means to me. It also rejects texts. Why is our Constitution always under attack these days? Because we live in a culture that rejects texts. So everything about the Bible, the culture is against. That's why we got to preach it. So in a way, expositional preaching goes against the cultural current, but also in a way it's refreshing. I'm telling you, more than once I've had the experience of people 
if you want to call them seekers, call them seekers. I believe there are seekers so long as God's been working in their heart already. Seekers who have gone to church to try to hear something new and they go to church after church after church and they're not getting anything. And they finally find a church where the word is being exposited and they say, wow, this is what I've been waiting for. How come I don't hear this? <laughs> because it goes against the culture. It's refreshing for people when they hear the word of God being preached accurately. All right. Let me just skip through this pretty quick. The power of expositional preaching is in the word, not the preacher, obviously. Uh, that should give you great confidence. Isaiah 55, 11 is a verse I was going to read, but y'all can just look that up. That's talking about the word of God going forth, not returning empty. Um, that should give you great confidence that the word of God does the work. Um, it should keep you from a woe is me attitude. And it also should keep you from a wow is me attitude. All right. A woe is me is, oh, I'm just such an awful preacher. I just preach so bad today. And a lot of preachers can do that. I was guilty of that a lot. If I find someone said, slap me upside of the face. Do you really think this is all about you? Oh, I guess it's not. Mm. Preach the word faithfully and see what God does with it. Don't sit here and get all moaning every Sunday. You know, okay. That wasn't my wife. Well, the other... The other attitude. Right. And so we, keep, we don't have to have this woe is me, but we also have to know that this wow is me. I'm, I'm just great. Wow, I just, I'm awesome. You know, the, the, the pride, the fact that God's word does the work and not us should kill our pride. As John the Baptist said, he must increase, we must decrease. We got to get out of the way. I think the key character trait to effective preaching is humility. Humility. Um, I got a quote here from Spurgeon. I'm not going to read it. It's long. I'll read you Martin Luther's. I did nothing. The Word did everything. When he was asked about the Reformation and all the changes that had happened late in his life, he said, I did nothing. The Word did everything. That's the attitude we should have. If you struggle with pride and arrogance and thinking more highly of yourself than you ought, then it's something you need to work on because you're not ready to preach yet. So you got to work, work on pride and ask God to kill the pride. Uh, and that brings me to something from, J Dave, from, um, Dave, from Brian Chappell's book. Um, th th real quick, if you guys can give me three more minutes, all right? You all good? Are we good for a few more minutes? All right. All right. Uh, he talks about, and this is your last, your blanks here. Good preaching involves these three classical aspects of any kind of public speaking. Logos, pathos, and ethos. Logos is simply the verbal content. It's the logic of the passage. It's written, written right there for you. Okay, that's the work we put into really breaking down syntax, all of that. Pathos, that's the emotive aspect of the sermon. That's the passion. That's the... That third S, the spirit of the sermon that we talked about before. And then there's the ethos. And listen to this. This is the perceived character of the preacher. The perceived character. It may not necessarily be the character of the preacher, but the perceived character. If you're a disorganized person and you come into the pulpit disorganized, disheveled, it will communicate that you don't care. Whether you wanted to communicate that or whether or not it's true or not, it will communicate you don't care. And that'll be the perceived ethos. That'll be how they, the character of the person. If you're the kind of pastor who gets easily distracted and you're not on a Sunday morning like I do, and, and you come across as unapproachable to people on a Sunday, whether or not you really mean it to communicate this or not, whether or not it's true or not, you may come across as, as a bit arrogant and distant. That you're, you're above the people. That, that happened to me. I'd be so distracted on Sunday. I'd walk past people. They said hi. I didn't even realize they said hi because I'm thinking about the sermon and everything else. I had to really work on that because people got the impression, you just, you just don't care about us. You know, all you, you know, the perceived character will come out. And so we got to work on that because that last, the, the, way, the way he talks about it, Brian, he talks about there's three doors. In those three doors, the last one is ethos. Um, well, let's go in this direction. You got your logos, your pathos, and your ethos. Uh, 
He says that sermon, in order to get to the heart of the believer, has to go through those three doors. And if that last one's shut, it's not going to get to them. And so you need, we really need to focus on what our character deficiencies really are, and then also what perceived character deficiencies we might have. That'll keep people from hearing the word. No matter how well we prepared the text, no matter how passionately we preached it, if there's something in our character, it'll shut the door from people hearing the Word of God. In other words, you may think I'm just kind of contradicting myself now. I just said it's not about us. The Word of God, it's about the power of the Word of God. You're right. It's not about us, so we can't go woe is me and wow is me. But I'll tell you what, we can put stumbling blocks in the way of the Word. God can still work, bulldoze through it, but we still shouldn't be putting stumbling blocks in the way of God's word by the by our own character problems. First Corinthians, First Timothy three, we talked about this. The character traits of an elder, they're all about character. None of them are about polit, uh, uh, professional proficiencies. They're about character. It's about the character of the person. And so, a few few passages here, and then we'll be done. Would you just listen to the importance of character? First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians one five. You, you hear all three things here. He says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, that's logos, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction, that's pathos, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. That's ethos. In other words, Paul said, we preached the word, we preached it by the power of the Holy Spirit with passion, and you know what kind of people we are. What passage was that? First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5. He told... Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Keep it Because he knew, Timothy, if you keep a close watch on your teaching, that's great. You're going to get this part down. But if you don't keep a close watch on yourself, the people are not going to hear you. Keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 8. For our appeal does not spring from error or impunity or any attempt to deceive. What Paul is appealing to here is the character of the preachers. But just as we have been approved by God and entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God who tests our heart. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor the pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. What was Paul appealing to? He's appealing back to his own character, his character and the character of the other apostles that preached to them. Listen, we didn't come greedy. We didn't come trying to make much of ourselves. We were gentle with you. And finally, a couple of passages from, from 2 Timothy 2. Again, Paul says to Timothy, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So there's that, this part. And he says this, But avoid irreverent babble, for it would lead people into more and more ungodliness. Don't get caught up in irreverent babble. Why? <laughs> Because you'll be perceived as a, as a type of person who can't get along with people. And he says this later in that text. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may become, come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So let me just harp on that last little bit right there. One of the biggest character flaws in pastors that I've met or guys that want to be pastors is quarrelsomeness. They want to fight. They want to fight theological battles. And quarrelsome men are not called to be preachers. There are a lot that are, but what happens? That door gets shut on a lot of their preaching. 
If you love controversy, you may not be called to shepherd God's people. And I've met many young guys. I mean, our church was a magnet for quarrelsome young men <laughs> when I was a plant at Harvest. Every young man that had a beef about every theological issue you could imagine came to our church. And many, oh, all of them wanted to be preachers. And for I had to work with them and work with them, work with them. I wouldn't license them to preach. I wouldn't do anything until they dealt with that quarrelsome behavior and quarrelsome attitude. And some of them did. And God humbled them and they became, you know, a couple of them already are preachers. That's great. But a couple of them didn't. One of them has walked away from the faith. Well, maybe he's now Eastern Orthodox. That's just to put it this way. Because he kept fighting every theological controversy he could find because he wanted to find the pure church. And now he's concluded that it must be Eastern Orthodox. Because he's a man, he'll leave that eventually as well. He's a man who always fights. And he's not being used of God right now. He's a brilliant kid, but he's not being used of God. So preach the word, guys. Remember John 6, 68, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Preach like that. Your people don't have somewhere to go. You have words of life that Jesus gave you in his word. Preach it. Preach it. All right, that's it for tonight. All right, uh, next week we will talk, or yeah, next week we'll talk about sermon preparation. It's going to be a lot practical. I'm going to draw a lot just from my own experience. It may be different from the way you prepare sermons and stuff, but I'm going to try to get practical. I'll pull from some of these books as well. And then we'll talk about sermon delivery in a few weeks after that. All right, any questions while we're packing up? Dinner, I'll provide dinner next week. Association will provide dinner next week. Yes. No, no, first, I want to do it the first. Uh, I want to do it the, the first Monday of each month. The association will try to provide dinner. Okay. Steak? Yes. I did say steak at some point, yes. So, uh,